Hi, thank you for joining tonight's Prince George's COVID-19 Teletown Hall update, um, or COVID-19 update with County Executive Also Brooks and administration leaders. We're going to start momentarily. Hi, if you're just dialing in, thank you for joining tonight's Prince George's COVID-19 Teletown Hall informational call with County Executive Angela Alsobrooks and administration leaders. We'll be starting momentarily. Hi, thank you. If you just dialed in to tonight's Prince George's County, COVID-19 Teletown Hall informational call with County Executive Also Brooks and administration leaders. We're going to be starting momentarily. Hi, thanks for dialing in to tonight's Prince George's COVID-19 Teletown Hall informational call with County Executive Also Brooks and administration leaders. Uh, we'll be starting our call momentarily. Okay, thank you so much for dialing in tonight uh, for um, another Prince George's County COVID-19 Teletown Hall and informational call um, led by County Executive Angela Also Brooks and joined by administration leaders and partners. Um, tonight we're, we're having another edition of the topic, What's the Latest with Vaccine Distribution focused on youth vaccination. And my name is David Sloan from the office of the County Executive. And we're so thankful that you made time for tonight's update. As always, we have a thoughtful agenda. You'll hear from our county executives um, and you'll hear from PGCPS CEO, Amonk Golson, uh, and our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Health, Human Services, and Education, Dr. George Askew. We also have our Chief Health Officer, Dr. Ernest Carter, and an advocate and leading pediatrician, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, on hand to help us with Q&A provided by Prince Georgians from all across the county. Since taking office, the county executive has been committed to communicating honestly and thoroughly with you and our entire collective family of Prince Georgians, and this evening will be no different. In the midst of this pandemic, she has empowered your government to act and to act with compassion, emphasizing policymaking that's thoughtful and always focused on preserving the lives of Prince Georgians. As we've navigated through the changing landscape of vaccine distribution across our country, our state, and here at home in Prince George's, County Executive Also Brooks and this administration have been laser focused on building vaccine distribution models that uniquely fit our community's needs with holistic and equitable approaches. She leads with compassion and with focus and care for us all. Please welcome our County Executive, the Honorable Angela Also Brooks. Thank you so much, David, and good evening, everyone. I want to welcome each of you to tonight's town hall and thank you for your willingness to stay informed about the latest with COVID-19 in Prince George's County. This evening, I'm so honored to be joined uh, by our county school system CEO, Dr. Monica Golson, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Health, Human Services, and Education, Dr. George Askew, our County Health Officer, Dr. Ernest Carter, and you've heard as well that Dr. Yolandra Hancock, an adjunct professor at the Georgetown, Wash the George Washington School of Public Health, uh, who is also an experienced pediatrician and public health expert. They have some important information to share with you as we continue to battle this pandemic and will be on hand to address any questions that you may have. Um, I want to provide a quick update on where we presently stand. The county remains in the substantial range of COVID transmission as defined by the CDC, averaging about 82 cases weekly 
per 100,000 residents as of today. And I'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out and thank you to Prince Georgians because that number represents one of the lowest transmission rates in the state. Despite the fact that our county was one of the hardest hit jurisdictions in the region, and we initially had one of the highest transmission rates in the state, we've now been among the lowest in the state for weeks. This is due to the hard work of Prince Georgians who care for one another, who have taken this pandemic seriously by wearing their mask and getting vaccinated, and I wanna thank you so much for looking out for each other. We'll continue to do what we can to keep Prince George and safe. Ultimately, we know the COVID-19 vaccine is the surest way to get beyond the pandemic for good. The more of us that receive the vaccine, the harder it is for COVID-19 to spread in our community. I wanna thank the hundreds of thousands of Prince Georgians that helped step up and join those that are proud to get protected against this virus. We know that 89% of adults 18 and older have received at least one vaccination in the county, and 78% are fully vaccinated. And when it comes to our seniors, well, almost 99% have received one dose, and nearly 89% are fully vaccinated. These are very encouraging numbers to see, and if you're still not vaccinated, please don't wait any longer to get protected against this virus. We are also continuing to follow the progression of the Omicron variant, and Dr. Askew will talk a bit about that shortly. What we know right now is that it's more important than ever to get a booster shot if you are already vaccinated. Booster shots of the COVID-19 vaccine are now available to everyone 18 and older in the county. You can receive a booster shot six months after receiving the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or two months after the single dose of Johnson & Johnson. The FDA and the CDC have said it is safe to mix and match dosing for booster shots. So that means that if you prefer a particular vaccine brand, you may choose which one to take as a booster regardless of which brand you previously received. We've already seen a good demand for booster shots and they're available at clinics and pharmacies across the county. So if you are already vaccinated and enough time has elapsed since you received your initial vaccinations, please go and get a booster to protect yourself. The CDC has also given the green light for children ages 5 to 11 to receive vaccinations. The health department is now providing these vaccinations, and pharmacies and pediatricians offices across the county have also begun providing these vaccinations. I know that some of you may have questions about the vaccine for children, and how safe it is. And so our medical experts here this evening can assure you that the COVID-19 vaccine for children is safe and effective. COVID-19 vaccines for children five through 11 years were developed and tested in the same way as adult COVID-19 vaccines. The FDA has authorized it and the CDC approved it after scientists conducted a rigorous testing process. Our medical experts on the call tonight can answer more of your questions in just a few minutes. As I mentioned earlier, we're trying to continue to lower our transmission rate in the county and getting our children vaccinated, we believe, is an important step toward this goal. Children who get infected can also spread COVID-19 to people in their schools, households, and social groups. We've also seen that children who get COVID-19 can get very sick and require hospitalization. Taking the vaccine can help prevent our children from suffering from very serious symptoms. Again, these vaccinations are now available, and we're already seeing so many parents bringing in their children to get vaccinated. According to the latest data from our health department, about 14% of children ages 5 to 9 in the county are now vaccinated, and nearly 60% of those ages 10 to 19 are vaccinated. We're also working hard to make vaccinations for children as accessible as possible. We've hosted two kids vaccinations clinics at the sports and learning complex already, and this is specifically targeting children ages five to 11. At the first one in November, we vaccinated over 550 children. At the clinic this past Saturday, we administered vaccinations and booster shots to over 800 residents, including vaccinations to nearly 500 children. We also have vaccination clinics available at our local libraries, which are taking place through the end of this month. 
And our child, our county's mobile vaccination clinics are presently hosting after-school clinics at dozens of public schools across the county. Dr. Golson will be on in a few minutes to discuss this further. All of this information is on our COVID-19 vaccine webpage, where you can find a list of mobile clinics, hours for the sports and learning complex, and a vaccine locator to find other locations across the county that offer vaccines. That webpage is mypgc.us backslash COVID vaccine. Again, that is mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. So please take advantage of the soonest opportunity to get yourselves and your children protected against this virus. If you've already been vaccinated, please take the soonest opportunity to get your booster shot. The more of us that receive the vaccine, the harder it is for COVID-19 to spread in our community and we can finally overcome this virus. You all are aware that we have entered now the holiday season. And I know uh, that after the last year and a half, we're embracing this opportunity to gather with friends and, and loved ones. And I encourage all of us to do what we can to make this a safe and happy time of celebration. We know how important getting the vaccination is to slowing the spread of COVID-19, but please don't forget the importance of also getting tested for COVID-19. This is significant regardless of your vaccination status. As we make travel plans and begin attending our various holiday gatherings, remember that getting tested is an additional step towards slowing the spread of the virus in our community. Our health department and the Office of Emergency Management are providing rapid and PCR COVID-19 testing at the Bunker Hill Fire Station in Brentwood. These tests are free of charge even if you do not have insurance coverage. And they're available Monday through Friday, 9.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. on a walk-in basis. And free COVID-19 testing is available at healthcare providers across the county. To find a testing site near you, simply visit health.mypgc.us slash COVID COVID testing. I'm going to give that again, health.mypgc.us slash COVID testing. Vaccinated individuals should get tested if you have COVID-19 symptoms or if you've had close contact with someone who you may suspect may have had COVID-19. If you are not vaccinated, please get tested if you've been in close contact with someone who has had COVID-19 or is suspected of having COVID-19. Let's all continue to do our part to make this a safe and happy holiday season. Again, I want to thank all of you for continuing to follow our guidance and working to protect the entire community. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the last year and a half very challenging for all of us, but Prince George's County has come a long way. I trust that this town hall will be very informative and will answer any outstanding questions you may have. Continue to work with us and we will continue to move forward together. Please continue to be safe as you go out and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. And if you're just joining, um, tonight's Prince George's COVID-19 Teletown Hall with uh, County Executive Olson Brooks, we'd like to welcome you. Um, we're now going to turn to our celebrated CEO of the Prince George's County Public School System, Dr. Monica Goldson. She oversees our system of over 130,000 students uh, and over 19,000 staff members. That is one of the largest systems in the country. Um, Our model here is that we're great by choice, and we are so happy to have Dr. Goldson. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, County Executive Asa Brooks, for also having me on tonight to talk about the COVID vaccine for ages 5 to 11. And, of course, all of our students, we're strongly encouraging them to get the vaccination. So as many of you are aware, which will continue to be shared tonight, the vaccination is the best protection against COVID-19. While we encourage that many of our students are at least partially vaccinated, we want all eligible students to get all of their shots. Thanks to our partnership with Prince George's County Health Department, we have made clinics easily accessible to our families. Mobile mobile clinics are available at approximately 50 schools, so there's a great chance that you can get your first or second dose close to home and you don't have to go far. 
Adults may also get their booster shots in our school clinics. So we want to make sure that we're being responsive not only to our students, but their families as parents as well. Now that the vaccine is available to children as young as age five of five years old, we look forward to welcoming all students who are in the temporary virtual learning programs back into our school buildings on January 31st. Nothing replaces the dynamics the dynamic experience between students, teachers, classmates, coaches, and mentors in our classrooms every day. And we're doing everything in our power to keep students and our employees safe during the school day, such as requiring masks in all PGCPS buildings and on school buses, and requiring employees to provide proof of vaccination or undergo weekly testing. Our schools are the best places for hands-on learning, social and emotional support, and socializing with peers. I appreciate the collaboration with the county executive and the health department and spreading the message that vaccination is the best protection against COVID-19. Please visit our website at www.pgcps.org for a complete list of clinic locations and operations. Please stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Golson, very much. Again, if you are just joining us, we'd like to thank you for joining the Prince George's County COVID-19 um, update and informational call with County Executive Angela Alsobrooks and our administration leaders and partners. My name is David Sloan from the County Exec's Office, and we're just so, so happy that you joined us tonight for this information. Our next speaker is... Uh, the dynamic uh, <laughs> Dr. George Askew, who is uh, one of our Deputy Chief Administrative Officers for Health, uh, Human Services, and Education. That is specifically Dr. Askew's portfolio. Um, if you don't remember what the role of a DCAO is from our last call, I'll remind you. Um, we have five DCAOs in our government, and these individuals have the collective responsibility of working to provide oversight over the 40-plus agencies that the government uh, has. They work in concert together and with uh, individual agency directors to ensure that our government is performing at as high a level as possible. Dr. Askew brings a commitment and a vigor to his role. He is always dependent on for accurate information, and we are very fortunate to have him. Dr. Askew, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, David, and thank all of you, and good, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for, for joining us. I, I'm going to use my opening remarks, opening remarks for, to, uh, to take the opportunity to address two issues that are sure to be on the minds of, of many of you. Uh, first is the Omicron uh, variant. Um, as many of you know, on November 26th, the World Health Organization classified a new COVID-19 variant as a variant of concern and named it Omicron. Omicron has been identified in the United States, including Maryland. We've recently seen our first cases of Omicron here. Um, so far, no official word if Prince George's have, uh, have Omicron or if we've seen it here in the county. We have not received any word that that is true. But at this point in the pandemic, we've learned that variants are most likely already around us once we start seeing it popping up in other places in the country and other places in our regional, uh, in our region. The CDC has been actively monitoring and preparing for this variant and continues to work diligently with other U.S. and global public health and industry partners to learn more. And we're learning more every day about Omicron. Uh, COVID-19 is constantly changing, and new variants of the virus are expected to occur, so we're not surprised that this, this happens. Sometimes new variants emerge and disappear. Other times new variants emerge and persist and persist for a while. The recent emergence of Omicron, of the Omicron variant, further emphasizes, though, the importance of getting vaccinated, the importance of vaccination, boosters, and general prevention strategies needed to prevent, protect against COVID-19. And Prince George's have done such a great job at vaccination, now going to get their boosters. And again, listening to the, the, mid, the, the prevention strategies and implementing them, um, that I'm hopeful that we are going to, you know, stay ahead of, of Omicron if we continue to do the things that we've been doing uh, up till now. 
everyone five and older, five years old, of age and older, should get vaccinated. And boosters are recommended for everyone 18 years and older. And again, we're seeing folks who are coming in and getting their boosters, and we're really excited about that. We will have time to discuss further uh, with, with our health officer, Dr. Ernest Carter, and public health expert and child and family advocate, Dr. Yolanda Hancock, a little bit more about Omicron um, and what's happening in the, in the country, uh, the state, and in our region regarding the, the emergence of this, this new variant. The other thing I wanted to talk to you all about during my opening remarks was the recent issue of expired vaccine doses that were distributed to 70 children here um, in the county. It's really important for us to be upfront and transparent with you always with, when it comes to the health and well-being of, of, of yourselves and your families um, and those around us. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware um, of this error that occurred at one of our COVID-19 clinics. Uh, again, on November 26th, our, our vaccination vendor at the Sports and Learning mistakenly gave expired doses of vaccine to 70 children. Now, the county worked quickly with Pfizer, the manufacturer of the vaccine, the CDC, and the state health department, and all agreed that the data make that, and all agreed that there were no safety concerns with getting an expired dose of vaccine. Um, but really, the issue was that you might not get the maximum protection from getting a, an expired vaccine. So in order to get children the maximum protection where we were having, um, it was recommended to get those children revaccinated. Um, the, the vendor has been retrained on vaccination protocol. This happened because a uh, vaccine that should have been thrown away ended up back in a place where it could be, mis it, it could be mistaken for vaccine that was, that was uh, still, still viable. Um, the county, as I said, has made contact with the families um, and they have been invited to two private clinics just for those families to get revaccinated. Folks are showing up. Um, and again, uh, understanding that getting revaccinated is important to making sure they get the full benefit of the vaccine. You know, we really re regret this era and we deeply apologize to those families for the concern and the inconvenience of getting their, their little ones vaccinated again. But again, happy to see folks responding as Prince George's do in times of uh, in times of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of problems, solving those problems and uh, stepping up and doing what's, what's in the best interest of protecting themselves and those around them. The Sports and Learning Complex has given out more than 40,000 doses of vaccine to protect Prince George's so far. They're an important part of why we have such low transmission rates in the county, because we're getting folks vaccinated, because we're wearing our masks. So this was a, uh, a human error and we have addressed the issue and we are ready to move forward. And we're seeing that uh, our, our families and our children are ready to move forward because folks are back out there getting vaccinated and it has me really, really excited. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, David. Thank you, Dr. Askew, very, very much. All right, so I also wanna do a few things here on housekeeping. Um, the county executive mentioned um, our uh, COVID-19 um, webpage that has all the latest information um, on COVID-19 in our county and, and the vaccine. Um, the address again is mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. That's mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. Also, I wanna make sure that um, if you don't hear a question uh, asked tonight that is on your mind, you can always email us at pgctownhalls at co.pg.md.us. That's pgctownhalls at co.pg.md.us. Um, and also, please follow the county executive um, at at CEX also Brooks. That's at CEX also Brooks on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we will be um, sending the recording uh, around via text message later this week and also posting the recording online as soon as it's made available uh, by our friends who are helping us produce tonight's call. So with that, I do want to turn us to uh, Q&A. We had questions sent in from Prince Georgians all across the county. And we've done our best here to kind of summarize um, the best sample of questions and the topics that they represent. Um, 
helping us with our uh, Q&A tonight are Dr. Uh, Monica Goldson, Dr. Askew, Dr. Carter, and Dr. Hancock. Uh, and I'm going to actually throw the first two questions to Dr. Goldson, and then I'll turn it to uh, our medical experts. So, Dr. Goldson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are some questions around um, COVID-19 vaccinations and school attendance, and one of the basic questions really uh, w was around um, children being required to be vaccinated in order to attend school. Would you mind addressing that? Sure. I get this question all the time, and actually the we do not have the authority to make that decision whether all students will be required to be vaccinated to attend school. That's a decision that falls on the Maryland Health Department. So um, in our superintendent's meetings, we do converse with the health department monthly. At this point, they're not um, going to require right now. We're continuing as a school district to encourage families to get their students vaccinated. I believe, this is just my belief, that over time um, it will become a requirement, but right now it's not. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and the next question around the Omicron variant um, and the potential of leading down to shutdowns or virtual learning do you mind giving in commentary on that subject? <laughs> sure. So the great thing is, is that everyone that you've heard from on the call tonight are people that I talk to on a regular basis almost every other day. Um, and now we're having conversations about um, the new variant. What we all agree on and we know is that the best way to fight this variant is to make sure that everyone is fully vaccinated. It is not our goal to go back to a virtual learning experience for all 130,000 students in our district. And the best way to do that is to ensure that everyone has access to our vaccinations and they get them. So I'm grateful that we have over 50 schools that have clinics so that our 5 to 11-year-olds can be vaccinated. So at this time, no, it is not our desire to go back to a virtual learning experience, even with the new variant. Thank you so much, ma'am. We really appreciate all the service that you do for our school system, for our students. And in the midst of a whole lot of uh, uh, adversity, we we recognize how hard you all have worked to put children first, and we thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now I'll turn to our medical experts. Uh, I want to bring in Dr. Hancock and Dr. Carter uh, and Dr. Ashew to help, you know, referee any any divvying up of responses, but let's just start with the basic question of vaccinations and safety. Are vaccines safe for five for kids five to eleven? Have there been any negative effects of the vaccine on children? Um, would you all mind addressing uh, those points? Start with Dr. Carter. <laughs> thank you, David, um, and thank you for the question. And, and vaccines are safe for children. There have been some very, very, very rare occurrences where a children who primarily in their adolescence had myocarditis, which resolved, uh, meaning that they had an inflammation of the heart muscle. And then we know that the COVID um, vir virus actually will attach itself to the heart muscle and infl inflame your heart muscle, your lungs, your kidneys. So we have had that. And then we've had other episodes where children get this syndrome where all, a lot of parts of their body get from the um, COVID um, virus, and we, again, it happens very rarely, but it does happen. So we, we those, those things, and I know um, uh, others will expound on it, those have been very, very, very rare occurrences. For the most part, and just the overwhelming part, is that this, this vaccine is extremely safe. For children, and I will say uh, just to to piggyback on what Dr. Golson said earlier, we support we've been supporting the the uh, school system, and we support children be staying in school despite the Omicron uh, variant. We 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 have we put those systems in place that will help stop the spread. So I don't want uh, uh, our public to worry about the safety of it. And I don't want them to worry about the Omicron virus in schools because our school system has done an outstanding job in making sure that we've protected our students against this virus and allow them to be able to, to go to school and, and have on-site on learning because it's so important to them. Thank you, sir. Um, and, and Dr. Hancock, there's a question here about like vaccines and 
the preference over one or the other to give to children um, and, parent, and parental choice. Do you do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I, can, I definitely can do that. For right now, the only vaccine that's approved for our adolescents and our children 5 to 11 is the Pfizer vaccine. And so at this point, there really isn't a choice to be made. The FDA has made that parenting choice for us, at least for right now. Moderna has submitted their paperwork for emergency use authorization for the adolescent use of the vaccine, and they soon will be submitting paperwork for the use of the vaccine in the 5 to 11-year-old population. But to expound on what Dr. Carter mentioned in terms of concerns around myocarditis, which is usually the most common concern that I hear about in practice here in Prince George's County, I think it's important for parents to truly understand what the risk factors are when it comes to myocarditis, either with the vaccine or with COVID-19. It's the reality of it is when parents decide not to vaccinate, the question is not vaccinate or not. It truly is to vaccinate or run the risk of children developing um, health issues as a result of the acute infection of COVID or what we call long COVID. The risk of myocarditis with a COVID-19 infection is one in 1,000. So for every 1,000 people who have COVID-19, one of them will get myocarditis in a very severe form of it. For those who get the vaccine, particularly the mRNA vaccines, 9,000 people will get vaccinated and only one person will likely get myocarditis. It's likely going to be an adolescent. It's likely going to be male. They're likely going to be white and the symptoms are going to be very mild, only lasting one or a couple of days. And there was recently a study that was just published just yesterday looking at over 140 children to support what both Dr. Carter and I have just mentioned. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, so let's stay here kind of in the same area. Um, and this question came in a couple of times about the possibility of children younger than five years old being able to receive a vaccination at some point in the future. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Hancock and Dr. Carter to comment on anything you may have read or heard or have learned of. Sure, I can jump in real quick because I just looked at this information and asking this question for one of my patients. The studies are still happening in terms of our under five. Uh, Certainly, it is pressing that we get this information over to the FDA so that we have vaccines to protect our six-month to five-year-old, given what we see in South Africa right now. Looking at the patient uh, populations that are most impacted by the Omicron variant, there are two. Our 65 and older in South Africa make up the majority of patients infected with and hospitalized by the Omicron variant. The second population is children under five. We also saw in the UK a couple of months ago when they had their surge that it was children five to 14 who disproportionately were impacted by this, what we're classifying as sort of a fifth wave of COVID. And so it's important for us to understand the timing of it, which will likely not be until January. But in the meantime, as County Executive also Brooks mentioned and Dr. Golton mentioned, it's about parents getting vaccinated, community getting vaccinated, continuing to do the excellent job that we have done as residents and continuing to mask up. And thank you, thank you. So, and it is important to understand all the parents to understand that there's not going to be a rush on getting this vaccine to the public unless it's deemed safe. So as you well know, as all of these vaccines have been done, the clinical trials will be done. It'll be reviewed by the FDA and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And then once that's done and everybody signs off and says it's safe and looked at the safety data, then the CDC puts a stamp of approval on it. And that's when we write the orders to say, let's go ahead and get those children vaccinated. So I, once it, it occurs and once it's deemed safe, then it will happen. And I don't want anybody to think there's, going, there's any rushing. It's never been any, any rushing to get these vaccines out. Although we we do want to get it out as soon as we possibly can, uh, so I just it goes through the process and and we don't come and, and don't expect it to be uh, uh, come any sooner than it can come with respect to how it's being looked at. Thank you, sir. Um, and I know that this topic was talked about earlier in the opening remarks, but again, for folks who have joined um, just now on the call. Uh, Dr. Carter or Dr. Askew, can you guys just remind folks where they can receive a vaccine, um, where children can receive vaccine in the county? 
sure. I can uh, I can take that one on. Um, you know, the, we have numerous places where children can receive vaccines here in the county, and we're really proud of our partners and the and the ready uh, the ready availability of vaccines. So many pediatricians' offices. So please check with your check with your doc check with your child's doctor. They may be offering the vaccine. Many pharmacies near you, CVS, Walgreens, Giant, Safeway, et cetera, are offering the vaccine. The county has the county has established and have been running clinics and dozens of elementary and high schools throughout the county. A full schedule can be found uh, online at mypgc.us forward slash COVID vaccine, uh, one word. Again, mypgc.us forward slash COVID vaccine, and that's one word. Um, the 5 to 11-year-old vaccine is also available at our standing cl- vaccine clinic at Sports, and Lear- at Sports and Learning Complex, as mentioned earlier. We've also partnered with the state to offer free vaccines for children at select county libraries. Um, we'd, l- we'd like to thank our library partners, uh, our, our, the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, for partnering with us, and a list of clinics is also available on our webpage, again, at mypgc.us forward slash COVID vaccine. Just a reminder to folks, the vaccines are free, regardless of your immig- of your insurance status or immigration status. The vaccines are free to you. Thank you so much, sir. All right, I have a few more questions, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, it's on the Omicron variant. Um, let me start with this one, um, and anyone can take it. Uh, what is the difference between the Omicron variant and the previous COVID-19 variants? This is Dr. Carter. Carter. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so, you know, just to, to say a little bit about what occurs when a, a virus goes through what they call a mutation. Period. Viruses always go through mutations because it's the way they survive. They they know that once they come out and and they start to infect people, that there will be the people will have immunity to them, and they start to try to figure out how to best keep themselves alive by infecting people. So they mutate. They change their chemical structure on some of their molecules so that they can be more sticky in your nostril so that they can reproduce themselves a little better. And that's what we could do. Every time they have one of these mutations to make themselves more viable, we call that a variant. And so this particular Omicron um, virus actually mutated about 50 or more times to try to figure out how it could keep itself alive while the Delta virus is being dealt with. It sort of figures out how to best do that. And what it did was of those variants that it, of of those mutations that it had, it did a lot of variation on the spike protein. About 30 of those mutations occurred on that spike protein, and that's what we make our vaccines toward. But it turns out that it does help that virus become more sticky, so it is, it does spread a little quicker than the uh, Delta virus, so that, and that, the Delta virus spreads pretty well. So this one spreads much better than the Delta virus. However, it's been found that it hasn't been causing severe disease like we we were uh, afraid of. And it turns out that being vaccinated actually helps you protect against it. It doesn't protect you from getting it, but it seems to be protecting you from having severe hospitalization and death. We'll see because the numbers aren't back yet, and we still got to keep an eye on it. But we're con- and we're concerned about it, so we're keeping our eye on that. And just know it's more infectious. But that's the difference. It's more sticky because it mutated. That makes it a different var- uh, different virus, and we call it a variant. Thank you very much. Uh, and there's another question on um, the last one I'll ask about um, vaccines and varying effectiveness levels against the Omicron variant. Is there any? data that's available or any insights that we should share well well david the the science community is still gathering data to determine exactly how effective the the vaccines are against the 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 variant Uh, at the very least we still know being vaccinated is much much better than being unvaccinated as dr carter pointed out um you know it looks as though it's it's still going to be protective 
against severe infection and, and hospitalization. Um, and again, just to remind folks, we also recommend getting a booster shot if you're an adult to increase your protection, um, you know, no matter what Omicron uh, might have in, uh, have in store for us. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and so we're going to wrap up here. Um, I'd like to just thank again Dr. Askew, Dr. Carter, um, Dr. Goldson, Dr. Hancock for your participation this evening in the county executive. It really makes a difference when we all come together to share vital information. Um, I hope that you all who are on have um, found tonight helpful. Again, we will be sending out the audio from this evening's call. Uh, via text message and on social media, please follow the county executive at CEX Also Brooks uh, at face on Facebook and Twitter. Again, at CEX Also Brooks um, at Facebook and Twitter, and the uh, most important website <laughs> for you to take a look at is our mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine. That's mypgc.us slash COVID vaccine for any. Um, information uh, relevant to COVID vaccinations and COVID-19 in the county. I also want to uh, highlight opportunities for donations and volunteerism. We are still serving people um, who uh, are struggling during the season of COVID-19. You can email us if you'd like to volunteer or donate uh, at COVID19-relief. That's COVID19-relief at co.pg. MD.US. So on behalf of County Executive Also Brooks and everyone here, I just want to reiterate that in our administration, we believe that it is our responsibility to ensure that residents across this county feel valued, supported, and connected to their government. Over the last year and a half through multiple mediums, we are proud to communicate and report that we have reached out and attempted to reach residents over 3 million times to make sure that they were receiving the information that we know is vital. And establishing a real presence in our community is the only way that government really truly succeeds in delivering its services. If nothing else, we want you to make sure you talk to your neighbors, check in on them, um, and we hope that you continue to believe that we are at our strongest when our residents are informed and empowered to be our partners in progress. Have a great night. Thank you so much.